And the next speaker is uh, Kai Hertz from the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics in Tübingen. And um, yeah, Kai will be talking about the pulse access the framework for open and uh, reproducible uh, magnetization prepared pulse sequences. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to your talk, Kai. Uh, stage is yours. Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, let me see. Can you see my screen? It works. It's not in full screen yet. Uh, no. Yeah, perfect. Right. Perfect. Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction. And uh, as Patrick already mentioned, I'm going to talk about magnetization prepared pulse sequences. And as you can guess from the title, it will be mainly about CES and how we try to do the sequences more open and reproducible. I have nothing to disclose. I want to start with a short intro about CES. So how does a CES experiment usually look like? Well, we have first uh, magnetization preparation followed by a readout. And during this magnetization preparation, we usually apply um, off resonant pulses here, the resonance frequency of A mines. And then we saturate the solute pool. Uh, it will exchange the magnetization with the water pool, lower the water magnetization, and therefore we um, can indirectly measure the cest effect by acquiring a normal cest image. Um, we usually do this over a broader frequency range, positive and negative side from water. And then we normalize by an unsaturated image to get rid of the um, influences from the readout sequence. And we usually acquire Z spectra to um, get effects from a lot of different solutes. So here, for instance, A mines, A mines, and so on. So they all sit here on this side. Um, yeah, the cest effect depends uh, among a lot of other parameters, of course, of the um, solute concentration. So if we have a higher concentration, we have a higher cest effect. And it also depends on the exchange rate, which is actually um, pH dependent, which makes it a very interesting marker for pathologies. So how does such a um, CES preparation looks in detail? Well, that actually pretty much depends on um, what you're interested in. I think one of the most um, prominent uh, CES applications is the APT weighted stuff. Um, they usually have um, yeah, shape pulses or not even shape pulses, but um, in the range of uh, mean amplitude of two microtesla. That was for instance, used for tumor applications here. Then the same power range two microtesla, but block pulses. They were then, for instance, used uh, here for um, stroke applications. Um, if you want to tackle the more pools selectively, you usually go for lower power. This is a multi-pool experiment here, for instance, where you can really um, exchange different contrasts in the C spectrum. I think this is data from 9.40 to my application. And if you go for um, higher power, that's what you usually do when you want to tackle um, faster exchanging pools. So this was, for instance, the Spiller protocol that we use them for uh, a glucose, dynamic glucose enhanced experiment. So as you can see, the, the CES preparation period um, is actually uh, defined by various parameters. Of course, it's the pulse shape, pulse duration, and so on, um, but also the power, what we use. And I just wanted to show you a quick example. So imagine you read a paper and someone says, well, I used to be one of two microtesla. So what did they actually do? Um, a good um, yeah, a good definition, in my opinion, is the, the B1 root mean square over the pulse strain. So if this was two microtesla here, for this case, we simulate that, we get a C spectra that looks like that. Another valid um, definition, what we also um, yeah, see very often is uh, two microtesla as the mean pulse amplitude. So basically a flip angle based um, definition. When we do that, you can see the power is slightly different and we also get a, get a different C spectrum. Another definition would be the peak power, for instance. You, you read a paper to microtesla, we use it as peak power. Of course, the C spectra will look again different. So um, it's really important to um, define clearly what you actually used. And while it might sound obvious that you have to um, yeah, de define your B1 correctly, there are also other parameters um, where you might not even know what's the differences. So for instance, let's take the pulse shape. Um, say we have a paper, um, B1 root mean square two microtesla. And then I just changed the epitization of the shape pulse a little bit. When you now look at the definition, well, unfortunately, C spectra again look different. And this is actually something you, yeah, you will probably not find in the paper. Uh, in the worst case, you don't even know about it because the shape is somewhere hidden in, in the vendor um, library. So um, as you can see, it's really important to have an exact definition of these pulses for standardization and reproducibility. And in the best case, such, such a um, definition would be in an open file format. And the requirements for such a format would be that it's, of course, easy to create, interpret, and share. 
it should be easy to simulate and of course easy to scan. And what I want to show you is how we try to achieve that with, with the Pulse Access framework. So how is it easy to create? Well, it's based on Pulsec. Um, I won't tell you that much about Pulsec, just that I think it makes your life much easier and that you should not forget to attend the Pulsec sessions later on. Um, but just quick, so you can define your sequences um, directly with an open source MATLAB or Python code. So here, for instance, our saturation pulse from before, we make a sync pulse with the flip angle, with the pulse duration, and with the appetization parameter for the shape. There are also a lot of other shape parameters. And then we add that pulse in an object-oriented way to our sequence object. This sequence events are then um, yeah, added to this object, and then we write it in a readable text file. So you can see here just a caption of, the, of, the, of such a pulse file. Um, you have RF events, gradients, ADC, et cetera. So this is, in my opinion, easy to share and compare because you can open it with a simple text editor. And what the nice thing is, also, since it's really text-based, we even have the possibility for version control protocols. And the parameters are inherently completely defined since the shape is written in the text file. So when we plot such a Pulsec file, you can see the shape here. This is really defined. You cannot change it on the scanner later on because it's written in the text file. And what is also very nice, in my opinion, is that we can see the, the phase evolution of the, the pulse strain um, because it's also written in a text file. And this is also a parameter which is usually never um, stated in any paper, although it can actually make a big difference if you start your pulse with a phase of zero or if you accumulate the phase over the pulse strain. And yeah, if you have um, more, more complicated pulses, such as spin lock here, for instance, um, you can see the phase evolution due to the frequency sweep. Um, yeah, if that's written in a text file, really you just share the text file. You don't have to um, copy the, the formula someone wrote in the paper and try to create a pulse by yourself. You just share the text file. So that's really reproducible in my opinion. So how is it easy to simulate? Well, we provide an open source block McConnell simulation framework. Um, you can find that on GitHub if you're interested. It's basically a C++ application and that is callable from MATLAB via MAX files. Um, we choose those languages for two reasons. First of all, the C++ application, because then we can use the exact same Pulsec file interface as on the scanner. So um, we really make sure that we read the same thing in our simulation that the scanner reads. And we can get all the MATLAB functionality from the original Pulsec package, which is, of course, also nice. Um, for the simulation, we also have a text file based input for the simulation parameters, such as water T1, T2, and the cesspool info, field strength, etc. And again, since this is text based, we also can have version control simulation settings, which I think is nice. And in fact, we, we have an open database available where we um, collect Pulsec files and parameter settings. I will talk about that later a little bit. Um, if you cannot or want not uh, use MATLAB, there are also alternatives for Python users. There's a wrapper who calls, which calls the exact same C++ simulation code actually from, from Python. Or if you don't like C at all, there's also a pure Python application. So as a last step, how is it easy to scan? Um, well, at least for Siemens idea, we have an interpreter sequence building block available. Um, and we use it the following way. So basically the Pulsec file is then played out as a preparation, as you can see here in the plot. We have here a short uh, capture of the Pulsec file. So we have our RF events here, um, uh, delays between the pulses. So this is our preparation. And then instead of acquiring data at this ADC event in the Pulsec file, we actually switch to the native readout sequence on the Siemens scanners. And it's basically compatible with every readout sequence where you have the source code from. This has also two advantages. First of all, we get the full Pulsec flexibility for the preparation period, and we have the full Siemens functionality for the readout, which means we can use all the um, reconstruction libraries and so on. It's, uh, yeah, in my opinion, fairly easy to implement. So if you have experience with Siemens IDEA um, programming, it's basically just as every other sequence building block. And it's also available um, as a C2P package with a gradient echo readout. In fact, we just delivered recently the first version to an external partner. All right, now, after showing you some methods, I wanted to um, quickly show some, some applications for what did we use the framework so far. Um, one application where it fits very well, in my opinion, is uh, CES MR fingerprinting. So as you met, might have noticed by now, the CES contrast depends on the preparation period. Um, which means if we vary the preparation period, we can generate unique signal trajectories for different CES parameters. Now these signal trajectories 
um, can then be simulated using our open source um, block McConnell simulation framework. And then we can acquire the same data and do a dictionary matching. So um, this is, for instance, a plot of the sequence that we used in vivo. Um, here, um, this is a spin lock preparation. And we just varied the um, B1, so the power of the pulses um, for, for, the, for, uh, for the repetition. So that's just part of that. Um, here's data. There was actually another protocol, not this one, but the phantom data, where you can really see um, when you have here is a root pool, you can really quantify the exchange rate and the concentration. And I think this is actually a very good fit for, for this framework because now we can uh, start from the Pulsic file. We can use that in our simulation. Um, we input the simulation parameters here as T1, T2, and our um, CES parameters, the exchange rate and the concentration. And then we generate a lot of trajectories, so a huge dictionary. And now the nice thing is instead of taking the pulses from our simulation and try to implement them on the scanner, we really just measure the, the exact same pulse file. So there's, uh, we cannot do any mistakes here by, by copying the pulses from the simulation to the scanner. We just measure the exact same thing that we're simulating. And then we get volumes. Um, they have a different contrast because we vary the saturation power. And we can do a voxelwise dictionary matching. Uh, yeah, this is actually data from, from Orperman from, from Boston. So basically what, uh, what we did there is um, we have a uh, magnetization transfer sensitive um, trajectory. And we trained a neural network with, with a huge dictionary that's just based on simulated data. And then we did the same for an amide uh, sensitive trajectory, also trained a neural network. And then with uh, T1, T2 and also field maps as input and uh, the PulseAc um, SES sequence, um, the, the trajectories for MT on, and amide specific sequences, they get there as an input. And then we actually can generate quantitative maps of concentration and exchange rate. And we actually tested that on three different sites with the same sequence um, at two Prisma scanners and tubing in Boston and actually a, a trio scanner, which even had a different software baseline. So I think this was VE and this was uh, VB. And if you're interested in how to generate such dictionaries and also how to do that uh, dictionary mapping, uh, Org Perlman has actually a very nice GitHub repository with a lot of explanations and code. So feel free to try that out. Another application, but I find important is uh, standardization. Um, so as I mentioned before, we have an open database, which has a collection of PulseSec files and CES preparation periods. Um, usually find there something like this. So this is basically a short identifier. So if anyone is willing to um, contribute their protocols, um, yeah, we include uh, the method and the field strength and some pulse info, et cetera. And every protocol usually comes with a generating MATLAB or Python file. So if you want to, redo the same experiment, but for a different field strength, you can just regenerate that short plot, how the magnetization preparation looks like and a link to the publication if there is one. Um, we can use that database actually to directly compare protocols. And this is then fairly easy. We can just download the PulseX file from, from the GitHub repository and then run it with our PulseX sequence. And here we actually did that on, uh, on one scanner. We compared three different um, actually previously published apt weighted protocols in vivo and in a, in a tumor patient. And yeah, since, since the protocols are all lying there around on GitHub, you can just download and run it. And I think this is nice. And actually my personal goal would be that uh, this, this will really be a database with all published protocols. So everybody who writes a CES publication, if they could just take the few extra minutes to generate such a PulseX file, um, upload it to the database, this would really mean that we can get fully reproducible protocols. Another application is pulse optimization. So usually the best thing you can do in, in CES is just apply continuous wave at a specific power, but uh, due to SAR and, uh, and um, yeah, also amplifier restrictions, it's usually not possible to apply one second pulse. So um, this is actually data from, from Graz. Um, what they did was an optimal control approach. Um, because when you, when you see here, when you switch from continuous wave to shape pulses, you actually lose cest effect due to the shape pulses. So they took an optimal control approach and try to maximize the cest effect by leaving the pulse shape free. And then they get some fancy pulses like this. And uh, yeah, I think the nice thing here about the framework is that you can directly export these pulses from your simulation settings um, into the pulse file. So you don't have to implement these crazy shapes on the scanner. 
And that means that you can really validate your, your simulation results um, pretty fast because you can just export them, run with the pulse success sequence. And here you can see that with this with this uh, shape, they actually came very close to the continuous wave effect, which is which is actually very nice. Um, another application, since we're in the vendor independent uh, um, session, um, is a Bruca hybrid sequence. So what we did there is basically um, we have the preparation also in the same pulse file, and then the readout as a as a Bruca PPG file. Then we have some MATLAB code which actually combines them and turns them into a SEST hybrid sequence. And here, I think it's nice that you can really do um, preclinical applications without any knowledge of sequence programming. You just run the MATLAB script once and choose the PulseSec file and read out. And there, I think it's it's a very good uh, connection between uh, preclinical and clinical protocols, because at, at Bruca, um, you usually just do continuous wave simply because you can. You don't have to do shape pulses or something like that. Um, it's not not worth to to um, yeah take the additional time because you just can't do continuous wave. But when this is also an easy approach, it's easier to um, actually translate um, preclinical to clinical protocols because you can implement shape pulses that would also work on a human scanner. And actually, we tested then the three APT weighted protocols that I just showed you in the, on the previous slide in vivo. I'm here in the Phantom at, at 14T, and. This MATLAB code is actually also available open source as a big uh, work in progress bracket before. Um, you can find it here. I think that's also now the last GitHub link I have in my talk. And yeah, we didn't have that much time. Actually, it's, it's from my colleague, Sebastian Müller. Um, I think it's the same problem as with the original Bruca interpreter for Pulsec. Um, not, yeah, yeah, so um, if you're interested and, and think that's a very cool application, so I think users, collaborators, and especially developers are, are more than welcome. And as a last application, since I also promised uh, magnetization prepared sequences, not only says this um, simultaneous mapping of uh, B0, B1, and T1, it's actually data from our co-moderator, Patrick Schinke. So um, if you did um, CES before, you probably know the Wasabi sequence that's usually used to um, yeah, to generate B1 and, and, and B0 field maps. Um, basically, you um, have this short pulse and you also acquire um, this over frequency range. And what they did was to include a T1 preparation in the sequence. And they also simulated that, similar to the um, CEST MRF stuff. So it's all just simulated spectra. They actually used the Python, um, the Python version of the code. And I think it's like 20 million spectra simulated in a day or something like that. You can correct me later if I'm, if I'm wrong. Um, but then they took the, the dictionary just from simulated data, trained a neural network, and then applied the exact, exact same PulseSec file that they used for simulation on, on the scanner. And you can see here in the in vitro results that it looks pretty well. Um, the, the, um, they also get an uncertainty map. You can see the uncertainty is just high in the phantom walls, which is expected. And also in vivo, it looks pretty well. So the difference to the reference method is uh, yeah, not that big. All right, so to sum up, I hope that I've showed you that we try to um, develop a framework for open and reproducible assess research. We try to achieve that by having MATLAB and Python code for designing protocols, simulation for planning and optimizing protocols, a hybrid sequence for measuring these protocols, and a database for sharing the protocols. And as a short outlook and also my personal wish list, What's definitely important is a sequence implementation for, for different vendors. Um, it's not really possible for us since we only have access to Siemens scanners. What would also be very nice is uh, to not only have the sequences and the simulation settings, but also um, post-processing pipelines for the protocols. So we also want to share that in, in our database. And of course, uh, if we really could have a, a PulseSec file in each test publication, um, this would really mean uh, full reproducibility for, for protocols. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. I want to thank everybody who provided me with uh, data and slides, and of course, the organizers for that workshop. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thanks, Kai, for this very interesting talk. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat yet, um, and we are already kind of running a little late. I just got a very quick question. So you mentioned that uh, your goal would be that everybody, yeah, put the PulseSec file in the um, database after publication of a, yeah, of a manuscript. Um, so what's the feedback at the moment? Did you receive any, any 
files yet or did somebody no. at least mention something <laughs> about the database? No, not yet. So we, as I said, we now um, distributed the first version to an external uh, user actually. And I hope that maybe if they start to use it and also develop their own protocols, might upload them. Of course, we always mention it in the in the um, yeah at uh, workshops, etc. But so far, I think people need the benefit, so they just won't upload it if they don't get a benefit from it. So I think without the sequence, um, there's not that much benefit yet. So I think yeah, before someone uploads it, they want to have something back. And I think if we distribute the sequence to more users, this would probably help. Yeah.